Uh, thank you all for joining us today for this panel. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to the moderator to begin. Okay, guys, thanks for joining us. I'm Ray Weigel, a uh, former recovering journalist, I like to say, uh, news anchor with Fox 32 in Chicago and did sports at ABC7. Sports are very near and dear to my heart. And today we are talking about nonprofits as brands and, you know, branding such a very important thing, not just in the corporate world, but in the nonprofit world as well. So we're going to take a, a much deeper dive into that today with our experts, Michelle Stroud, Larry Gulko, and Scott Weingust. Um, first, I'm going to tee it up to let you guys introduce yourself. Michelle, uh, I do want to point out because I don't, I know she's a very modest woman. She's also a pool champion. Oh so, my God. <laughs> uh, She's a champion pool player. So so give it to us straight, Michelle. Tell us about your background. No, I no, no, um, no, no, no. She's not a pool champion. She's a pool hustler. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm a hustler. I did I did hustle some pool back in the day. Um, but those days are gone now. I'm a much more responsible, upstanding citizen. Um, so <laughs> I started my career back in New York in advertising. And um, actually that's when I played pool. So those two things might go together. Um, you know, lots of, lots of agencies had pool tables back then. Um, in any case, so started in account planning, um, account management. So on the strategic side, um, did that for a number of years. And then when my husband and I moved overseas or before we did that, I started a consultancy working with nonprofits, um, on their marketing and communications and their strategy. When my husband and I moved overseas, I continued to do that as well as, um, worked as a print journalist doing work for um, English language newspapers as we lived overseas, moved back to the US. And when we moved back to the US, I knew I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector. Um, so it was really intentional about building some of those experiences, um, serving on boards, doing various trainings, and just kind of trying to gather the information and experience that I thought I might need. Um, and so when we moved back to the US, I started working in the nonprofit sector doing fundraising principally, as well as um, for small organizations doing a lot of the strategic work um, that had kind of been the anchor in the beginning of my career. Um, in December, uh, I made the choice to um, step back from the fundraising role um, and kind of shift back to kind of the core of my experience, which was really the marketing strategy. Um, you know, all those things fit together. It's telling stories. It's um, you know, understanding your brand and, and communicating it effectively. And so, um, you know, right now I'm working with a lot of kind of young organizations on putting those pieces together and helping them establish the foundation that they need to be able to um, sustain and grow um, their organization as they move forward. So it's a little bit of the marketing and it's a little bit of the communications work and it's a lot of the strategy work. Um, and certainly storytelling is part of it as well. So that's kind of my general background and why I'm here today. I'm really happy to be here. Storytelling, so very, very important when it comes to branding and, and communicating that message on multiple different platforms. Larry, you're up, sir. You're on deck. Or not on deck, you're at the plate. Uh, yeah, right, plate, right. Well, as you can tell, um, I parked my car in Harvard Yard. I'm from Boston. <laughs> and, and, um, and right now I'm in Cape Cod where it's beautiful. In Boston, it's like 104 degrees. So it's nice not to be in the humidity and the and the the brutal weather up there. But anyhow, um, it's interesting. My, my career, uh, there's some parallel with Michelle because Michelle, I did have an advertising and bring consultancy in Boston for 20 years. And then we dealt with nonprofits and startups and early stage companies, entrepreneurial ventures, uh, divisions of Fortune 500. And when people ask me what I do, I always tell them, I help companies take their brand to the next level. And next level is something different for everybody. And so through the years I've worked with companies, you know, two or three you know, people from Mass Challenge just trying, I mean, they, they weren't, they weren't nonprofit. They were not profit. They, they, they didn't have any seed money or money to build a business yet. But I, I mentor a lot of businesses at Mass Challenge and they're worldwide from Dubai and Israel and so forth, very successful. And also I work with uh, 501c3 nonprofits as well as, you know, divisions of Fortune 500. But I think the main thing is um, besides what I do for that, I also, um, I've, I've had, a, I've had a, a program with Harvard Business School for the last 14 years called the CEO Brand Leadership Roundtable. And we have four CEOs come in for a four hour program every year. And uh, last year I had Sylvia Acevedo, who's the CEO of Girl Scouts of America, which is amazing. And what they're doing is a nonprofit. And then, you know, other organizations. And besides that, I have a um, podcast series. Uh, if you, I'm just saying, if you go to cbsboston.com, you'll see 25 interviews from the chairman of Bo, Bo's, the chairman of Duncan and so forth. And right now I say like, like say in Hollywood, uh, we're in hiatus because of COVID-19. There's nobody coming in the studio. There's nobody there. And, but uh, hopefully we're going to get back on track, I think in January. And so, you know, through the last uh, maybe five, six years, I've been doing a lot of public speaking as a keynote speaker. 
but but mostly um you know what i try to do is help companies really find their voice find their focus and really differentiate like i, I think michelle mentioned earlier um off um off screen you know i think michelle you, you had a statement something like you know what would um if you went away your business what i think was like um why why would someone miss you and I always tell people, don't be the best, be the only. And I really try to work very diligently with clients and help them, you know, what are you the only at? Because if you're not the only, you're a commodity. You might have a brand name, but you're not a name brand. And when you're a commodity, people buy you one thing alone, that's price. And unless you're tagged at Walmart, I don't want to be in the price business. So um, that's kind of a Reader's Digest version of what, what I've been doing for the last 30 years. And so I think that also between Scott, Michelle, and myself, we, there, there is like an intersection of what we've done, but we come from different perspectives, different angles, different lanes, which I think is going to really, really make it really interesting and entertaining for the uh, program today. So, Larry, I know Sylvia, actually. She's an awesome woman. And you know something? People, people don't might know it, but Sylvia was born, yes, you know, you lived in New Mexico, right? Uh, Mexico. In Mexico. Yeah, and Sylvia was from New Mexico, and she really uh, was the first uh, Latino to get her degree at Stanford as a rocket scientist. She worked at NASA and she really is a rocket scientist. And then she went to be on the board of Girl Scouts and then she became CEO. And about eight months ago, she left Girl Scouts, but she truly is a rocket scientist. When I had her at Harvard, I never, I, in my 14 years doing a program at Harvard, I've never seen somebody give an answer to a discussion and everybody stand up and applaud. I, I was looking like, what's going on here? And she is just, she's brilliant. She's personable. She's a real deal. And someone started yelling out to her, you got to run for president. <laughs> yeah, she's cool. If you guys ever need a speaker that isn't one of right. us. She's great. Sylvia is your go-to. She's great. I Sorry, agree. Scott. Didn't mean to step on you there. You're no, up, Scott. No, no problem. All right, Scott, we're through. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so my name is Scott Weingast. I am a managing director at a firm called Stout. Um, we're a consultancy, about 500 client-facing professionals around the U.S. and uh, in a few locations outside the U.S. Um, at Stout, I lead the intellectual property valuation practice. So I'm valuing um, things like trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights, patents, the right of publicity, really all sorts of intangible assets. And I'm doing that for all different reasons. So um, we're going to get into some of the reasons why uh, I think during this conversation, why one might want to value assets. Um, like those uh, as part of a you know a not-for-profit brand maximization brand um, commercialization type of effort, uh, but ultimately it's really things like trademarks, which represent the name of the brand, the logos. Um, it could be uh, copyrighted materials that are used for promotion uh, of a brand, um, and then the right of publicity which sometimes for brands is relevant when they're bringing people like athletes in to help promote the brand and, you know, and how should these folks, um, how should we value the compensation or the contribution that they're making to the nonprofit? And, and we'll get into that a little bit deeper. I'm um, just, a, a, I didn't really go much on me, but I, I'm now a, a media consultant. We do media training. We formed a group called the Weigel Media Group and we do storytelling uh, as branding and the most uh, success we've had have been in the nonprofit space, but we're throwing this word brand around a lot. And you know what, we're going to start, you know, as Drake said, start from the bottom. Now we're here. What do we, what, what is a brand? And Michelle, we'll leave that off with you. What does that, what does that mean in case it's not self-explanatory? Well, I think I'll, I'll be interesting to hear everybody's answers. Cause I think it's different for everyone. Um, you know, for me, I think a brand is that unique piece of, you know, it's, it's an intangible um, so your brand is how, you know, it's everything from how people feel about you to what it is you represent and who you are. And so there's obviously the functionality, but, um, you know, shampoo is shampoo is shampoo, but the brand is the one that makes you feel good or beautiful or, you know, those kinds of things. So when we're talking in the nonprofit space, you know, I think your brand is what do you stand for? And, um, and and how, and then all of those other pieces, the communications pieces, whether it's your logo or your trademark or your marketing materials, those are all things that are in service of that brand. But for me, the brand is essentially, um, you know, who you are, what what you represent, and what and what you do. You know, to piggyback on what Michelle said, um, I want to give you an example. Um, in my podcast series and, and CBS, I had the CEO of Newman's Own, and Newman's Own has, has three hundred products. And Newman's Own is not, I always say, I tell people, you know, what are you really selling? Newman's Own is not selling lemonade. 
They're not, they're not selling uh, Italian dressing and they're not selling marinara sauce and pizza. Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Newman's Own. And when, when you're brand loyal to a brand, prices are relevant. You know, you will find the money. It doesn't matter because that brand, like Newman's Own, what they're selling is philanthropy. And when you see that 100% of their profits go to children's charities, and to date, they have donated over $1 billion to children's charities, sadly, with children who are fighting cancer. I mean, it really it really hits a nerve. And if they have a meaningful conversation and the, and the food tastes good, which it does, I'm a, is it the best food in the world? I don't know, but I don't care. But it, it, it's fine, but I, it makes me feel good. So I'm just saying, if I pay $2.49 for, uh, for a um, jar of salsa from Newman's Own, and maybe you're, um, another brand's $1.89, it doesn't matter to me because I feel good as a consumer. Like, like what just now Michelle said, you know, when you hear a brand name, what are you feeling about them? What are you thinking about them? And so therefore, if you're a brand loyal to them, it's like, you know, you know, the 50,000 stores, um, products on the supermarket, when you go down that aisle and you see Newman's own, you take it. It's not the price. It's the fact that it makes you feel good. So I go back to what I said earlier, if a brand can have an authenticity and a brand can communicate a meaningful conversation that's near and dear to our emotional connection, our, our sweet spot as consumers, Brand loyalty is huge. And years ago, I used to consult with Disney and Disney will tell you that they don't care if you're satisfied or not. They really don't. You spend a week, they don't, they don't care if you're satisfied. Are you loyal? If you come back 10 years later, they, they, I'm just saying, they're not very happy. So piggyback on again, what Michelle said, you know, the look and feel, but the thing is like, how do you create brand loyalty? So people will buy your product over and over and over again because they believe what you stand for, uh, your brand voice, and also, We'll get involved in this conversation. You know how purpose driven are you? You know what are you doing to make a difference? Not just um, about profits, because if you have no purpose, you have no profits. And and anything, even even an association. I used to do all day. I used to do a lot of work with um, ASAE and DC, which is American Society Association of Executives, and they're all five hundred one c threes, and they're all fighting for mark, you know for capture market share. And if you capture market share, you'll drive market. I'm sorry. If you capture mind share, you'll drive market share. And yeah, so and I think you, you guys have done a great job. I'm not sure there's a lot to add, but certainly some of the key themes in my mind when I think about a brand and, and looking at it from the brand owner's perspective, it's about what type of story and promise do I want to communicate to people who are going to buy my products or services? What do I want them to think about when they hear my name, when they see my name, when they see a symbol, when they hear a slogan? What do they think about? What are the characteristics of my business, of my products, of my services that I want people to feel? And for the consumers, it's the opposite. It's, it's when I see those words, it's when I, when I hear that phrase, it's when I see a symbol, what does it make me feel? What are the characteristics of that company um, that I associate it with? And that gives me a brand feeling. It gives me a feeling about the, the, about the products, the services, and makes me want to buy it for a certain reason. It differentiates a particular uh, company and their products from others that they're competing with. Um, so in my mind, it's, it's all that goes into communicating that brand promise and that brand story about the company, about the products. And it's about how the consumers feel when they hear the words, when they see the symbols. Uh, and Scott, I would say also, and delivering on that brand promise every day, not just a one-off, but consistently. So people know they can depend on the experience that you've curated and they're going to deliver to you every time you touch them. Like, you know, I'm just thinking just now, like, I know it's not nonprofit, McDonald's, their, their whole tagline, their, their mantra for 15 years, I'm loving it. They're not saying hamburgers or no, this and that, I'm loving it. So if you can evoke a smile or a response or a certain feeling about that brand, like, like McDonald's, whether, it, whether it's chicken McNuggets, so it doesn't matter what it is, I'm loving it, meaning you're going to get a great experience. You're going to enjoy, you're going to love and respect our brand. Yeah, and, and I would say, Larry, you're right. And, and, and the thing that I think people need to keep in mind is that, is that a brand, to some extent, is dynamic, right? Because you, you want to follow through on it consistently every day, but then there are problems, right? There are hiccups and things that affect your brand negatively sometimes or positively, and it changes people's perceptions. But it, the consistency around how you communicate it, what, you know, how you get people to feel about it is, I think, the key to a really good brand. So Scott, you know, you're in this kind of intellectual property, you know, valuation space, if, if a brand is about how we feel, how do you protect that? Yeah, so I, you know, just, to, just to, as a disclaimer, I, I'm, not, I'm not an attorney. So you know, although I, I value legal protections, uh, I've, got, I've learned a lot over the last 20 plus years doing this, but 
Um, but I'm not, I'm not specifically a lawyer, but, but, you know, ultimately the way that when we, when we first start a brand valuation, our first question to the clients are, what assets are you employing to communicate your brand? And, and inevitably the key assets are from a legal protections perspective are gonna be trademarks, whether you are formally registering those um, with, you know, for instance, the US Patent and Trademark Office in the US, or whether you're just protecting them uh, with a little TM next to your name or symbol, um, which indicates some common law protections. Trademarks are typically the key they represent not only the name, but the symbols and the phrases that are used to communicate a brand. Um, but then we also have things like domain names um, as a, obviously today a key part of a brand being able to direct people to uh, a particular spot, having a really good domain name that people remember and that are affiliated with your name. Um, that could be a key part of a brand. And then also copyrighted materials, things of original work that relate maybe to the way you promote your brand and your products and services. Although from an asset perspective, I'd say those are the three things, the copyright, trademarks, and the domain names that really, from a legal protections perspective, support a brand. So you were talking earlier, Larry, about McDonald's, you know, their brand story is pretty clear. So what we're talking about now is developing that brand story for a nonprofit. Uh, you know, how do you do that specifically, you know, getting into the strategy and, you know, the editorial strategy is, as I might call it. And Michelle, let's start with you. Oh no, don't start with, let, let somebody else start well, for change. Go Larry. ahead. All right. Yeah, I mean, how do you- <laughs> oh, I mean, No, listen. no, no, let's go to Scott. No, no, okay. No, okay. I mean, is, it, is it a remedial question is to no. ask, you know, how do you find that brand story? I mean, look, for a nonprofit, it should be obvious. It's a pediatric cancer charity helping kids, you know, fighting a terminal illness. You know, that's pretty obvious. So, you know, I mean, is there anything to it that, that, that for a nonprofit to, to be different, as you put it, be unique? You know, when there are, it's a crowded field. There's a lot of nonprofits overlapping in a lot of different spaces. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it sounds like, you know, do they need to think like a business, a corporation, uh, you know, in terms of in developing that brand strategy? Yeah, you know, they really, I find a lot of nonprofits I deal with and some of them in the golf industry, they really, they love golf. They think it's a hobby. It's a cottage industry, whatever, but it's a business. And I know that I know three or four organizations in the golf industry that are very much like me too. And I think as far as the whole brand landscape, some of the biggest problems on branding, especially for nonprofits, is that they, they either lost their focus or don't have a focus. Uh, they've commoditized themselves. They have, they're not creating a remarkable uh, member experience. I mean, let's face it, every year when that bill comes, the invoice, the rejoin for 400 bucks, whatever it might be, they make a decision and they just say, this organization, this 501c3 nonprofit I belong to, they haven't really, either they're the same themselves, they haven't delivered on their brand promise experience, I expect, or shame on me, they're doing a great job, but I have not been really involved. You know what I'm saying? So, but when that, when that en envelope comes, people make a decision, have, have, is it valuable? I mean, let's face it, there's so many people who are knocking on our doors to join organizations, have webinars, go to conferences, whatever. We have to pick and choose. As we pick and choose those organizations that we feel are really very special. And I always tell the, uh, my clients, you know, um, in the category that you're in, what do you perceive makes you so special that you're really truly and authentically unlike any other brand in that category? So, and I also tell people as well, they say, oh, well, we're doing great. I said, no, you're not doing great. Because I, like Mark Cuban would say, every minute of the day, somebody's trying to steal your lunch 24 seven. And I also tell people, if you think you're betting a thousand, you're losing. If you're betting a thousand, you're complacent. And Jack Welch, I knew years ago as GE CEO, he always said, Larry, if you don't change the game, the game's going to change you. So it doesn't matter how powerful, you, how well known you are, there's always room for being more powerful, more relevant, more personable, and more um, driven to emotionally connect with that consumer. And you got to treat them like, like your best friends. And sadly, I read a story the other day, and maybe Scott and Michelle read similar stories, but it, it blew my mind. The average CEO of a company in general works 70 hours a week and only spends 3% of the time talking or dealing with a member or a consumer about the business. So how can you really enhance the member experience or the customer experience of your company if you don't know what the heck it's, they're living? I mean, how can you do something? It's like, how can you strategize the ivory tower if you're not in the ground level? So, you know, there was a while ago that there, I remember the, the CEO, Rich Carlton said, you know, Larry, the, my most, most favorite days I have is when I never get back to the office. I'm with my employees, I'm with my customers, I'm with my staff, 
I want to know what's happening 24 seven. It's not happening in the office. It's happening on the property. So I say to the nonprofits listening today, it's not happening in the corporate office. It's happening in the field. It's happening in your conferences, your conventions, your virtual programming. But if you're not having a dialogue with your constituents, how can you enhance this experience or change something, even though it's like, and I'll, I'll end this one thought. I interviewed the CEO of Delta Airlines and he sits, Ed Baston sits in coach, four rows from the bathroom into the middle seat. Not in first class, not in a private jet. And he says to me, Larry, that's where the action is. That's it, it's very think- simple. And he runs a $58 billion company. So if he can do that with 58 billion, a nonprofit with two employees, four employees, 10 employees, it's much easier. I mean, if, if, if Delta can do that, living and breathing experience, there's no reason and has nothing to do with budget. This conversation we're having today has nothing to do with money, has to do with culture and thinking about your company or your, your, your organization on how you can take your brand next level. It has nothing to do with money at all. It really doesn't. It's how you look, how, 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 you, look at, how, you, look, how you look at your own DNA. And who are you? Like Michelle said, it's all about storytelling. What's your story that's compelling that'll differentiate you from anybody else and, and keep getting stronger and stronger story and don't get weak? Well, I think, you know, when you talk about establishing a brand, you know, Larry, you're kind of in that, how do you get bigger space? But I I think part of maintaining the integrity of the nonprofit as a brand is to really start with the fundamentals. It's, It's understanding what is your core value proposition? What do you do that nobody else does? And I think a lot of nonprofits, you know, um, the wonderful thing about nonprofits is they're founded by people who are really passionate about something. Um, and that's a beautiful thing, but they don't always, not all founders take a look around and go, um, is what I'm doing unique. And so, you know, I think there's an argument for partnership with other, um, nonprofits or to really, you know, take that step back and do that business analysis in terms of what is the market? Who am I serving? What need am I filling? And, and the question I always like to ask people is, if, um, if you didn't, if you stopped existing tomorrow, what would be missing in the world? I love and that. That's, that's the thing. That's your core value. Um, and so building from that, and if you're clear about what your mission is, and you're clear about what your core value proposition is, and, and, and in your vision, then you can constantly come back to that as your anchor so that when somebody has a fabulous idea, and sometimes donors have great ideas, they want to give you money to do X, but you always have to ask that question, is this in line with my mission? And if it's not, don't do it. Because over time, you know, I think that passion to serve, that passion to do more, that passion to be in the community um, is so great that you slowly start to move away from your brand. And if you don't protect that brand, um, you know, it's, it's all about who you serve, right? When you're in the nonprofit space, nobody's getting something in return. If someone's sponsoring you or donating to you they're not getting something tangible they're getting a feeling and so you have to constantly reinforce that by demonstrating the value of their support of your organization and ultimately that's the people you serve and if you move away from that if you're not clear about what you're offering then it's hard for people to say i want to continue on board with you i want to continue to grow and evolve and support your your organization as you as you evolve um, so you have to be really clear and anchor yourself in those core principles and then measure everything against that as you move forward. It's, it, yeah, yeah. it's funny. Go ahead, Scott. I'm sorry, Nathan. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you're, you talk about mission, vision, but all in, and values and all of those things. And, you know, like you said, it's got to be top to bottom. Uh, in terms of, you know, everybody's got to be in lockstep with the brand mission, the same way you have to do it with a corporation. But Scott, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Larry, I think the thing I heard say something about it is not about the dollars and cents all the time. And, you know, it's funny because my whole view of the world, uh, you know, for good or bad is, is through dollars and cents when we're trying to figure out what something is worth um, to somebody. We're always thinking about, about the dollars and cents. And, and what, you know, one of the things I've, I've kind of observed over time is that um, given the nature of nonprofits, a lot of them are, you know, are obviously uh, charitable type organizations. And you know every dollar that comes in really matters as far as meeting the needs of the organization and what they're trying to accomplish uh, for the you know for the good of the community um, or their constituents. And what I sometimes find is that the branding really falls to the wayside, and you don't see the type of investment 
not necessarily even dollars, but of time and other resources into thinking through what the brand should be, how do we build it, um, and then actually following through and in doing some investments into that. And so, you know, a lot of times we're seeing kind of very bare bones efforts to enhance the brand, but ultimately that brand is really representing to all of your potential donors and all your constituents who you are and what you're about. And so, you know, there has to be some balance there, of course, but I feel like a lot of times we're seeing not enough time and energy and money spent on, you know, building the brand, which in the end, you know, I think has a long-term benefit for organizations that are able and willing to do that. Now, I'm going to take off my moderator hat briefly to share an anecdote, and then I want to get the reaction from Michelle, Ari, and Scott. So what I do is, you know, I, we, do, we do culture and branding videos, and we love working with nonprofits. And, you know, we usually say, well, it's going to be about, you know, $2,000 a video. Oh, my gosh, that's so, I, you know, you don't have that in the budget. And I said, well, how about this? How about instead of that, let's do, let's work out where whatever fundraising efforts you use to use this, we will take a percentage on the back end. Okay, that's fine. So we did two videos for a nonprofit in Evanston, which would have cost them, you know, $2,500. They made $100,000 off of those two videos and they had to give us $10,000. And, and, and I was, you know, and I, and so I, I, my limited experience with nonprofits is that they don't understand the concept of investing in marketing and conveying that message and their story. Um, Michelle, you, you're very passionate about storytelling. Can you, can you speak to the need to you know, get that story out there? Because a lot of nonprofits just kind of think we're doing good work, the money should just come in. But it, it, in my experience is no, that's not enough. You've got to convey your story. You've got to get the message out there and don't just send out a press release, get creative. Do you, do you agree or can you, uh, uh, you I know, completely disagree? completely agree. You? you know, and it's that constant struggle uh, between, between, you know, the resources you have and the resources you're trying to get. I mean, as a part of one of the difficulties of being a development person is people going, well, how much, if I give you that development assistant that you want to hire, um, are you going to return an additional $5 million this year or whatever? It's like, well, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to get any closer without additional support. But if you give me support, I can start to build the, re the materials and the connections and the resources that will get us to that number. That's not a, that's not a nonprofit mindset. Um, and so I think, you know, I, because I came from the corporate side into nonprofit, um, a lot of the challenge that I faced as a fundraiser was kind of helping people understand the value of that investment. And so when I did my budgets, my budgets built in the cost of production. And I will say that my production costs were probably higher than a lot of other nonprofit people because I get it. Like I know the value of it. I also know how much things really cost. And so, yes, I, you know, make deals. My husband has a production facility in his um, office and, you know, I've gotten a little help there and a help from another friend who has a print shop and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But I can guarantee that when I do the budget, I budget the full cost of it because I want people to know what it is. So, and, and so that's a, you know, anybody here that's on the call, when you're getting, um, when, when people are helping you along, particularly small nonprofits, people will give you a discounted rate, sometimes all that stuff, make sure they bill you for the real cost of it and then provide your nonprofit discount because your board and your finance people need to see what the real value of those things are. That's the big mistake is that people don't tell you what it's really worth. And, and another to do that because you have to make that investment. And then when you do make this, as I'll be one second later, when, when you do make that investment, you absolutely see the return. And so um, just an investment in even doing galas, everybody like let's, spend lots of money on galas. Well, there's some places where you should spend the money and there's some places where you shouldn't spend the money. Um, but if you make the right investments, um, you can yield a tremendous return. But it's, it's I mean, I, I agree with you, Rafer, but it is a struggle because most nonprofit people aren't coming from, they're not coming from a finance background. They're not coming from the marketing background. They're coming from a program background and they have this passion to do this thing. And so it's up to, communications professionals and marketing professionals and finance people to help bring that along. But that is that is um, very frequently a gap in the nonprofit kind of infrastructure. I, I think the most important thing 
that the CEO or president for a nonprofit can do is to surround, surround him or her with a board of advisors, and Michelle touched on it, with people who are not from nonprofits, but people who came back from corporate experiences, whatever it might be, healthcare, high tech, I don't care, iconic brands, you need to have a good advisory board. And I must say, you got to pay them $15,000 a quarter. Many people will, would love to be an advisory board for nonprofit pro bono. I do, I do that all the time. And so you have 12, 15 people. I mean, they welcome it. The CEO and the C-suite, you want to call it, of a nonprofit, welcomes different perspectives, different points of view, because th that's what they want, you know, because a lot of them have never been in corporate America, have really, you know, been with the iconic brands, or created strategy, or launched even a brand. They've managed, you know, a lot of these, a lot of folks in nonprofits I, I've seen, they manage the brand, they manage the budget, they manage, but they don't launch. And and, so, and also, playing off what Michelle said, which is music my ears, you know, everybody wants to cut expenses by making investments. I and mean, they always say, oh, gee, you're expensive. No, no, you're not expensive. So whatever Michelle charges is irrelevant. She's not expensive. And I don't know Michelle well at all, okay? But, I'm, she, but people are making an investment in her, saying, hey, invest with me because you're investing in your future. So cut expenses, make investments, but surround yourself with really good, passionate people who are not just passionate, but committed. And I want to just play some, I want to play a thought process in some of you from Chicago. And Michael Jordan was one of the best basketball players ever to live, right? Michael Jordan was huge in basketball, right? And then when Michael Jordan re I retired, do you remember what he did? What other sport he took up? Do you remember it all? Baseball. Baseball. Oh, baseball. Oh. Now, did, did, did he succeed or fail in baseball? He failed. failed. And, and he says that. You know why he failed? He had a passion and commitment in basketball. He never had a commitment to baseball. He had a passion. So playing off again with Michelle and, and, and Scott mentioned, you have to, it's not everyone's saying, oh, passion, 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 passion. I'm so tired of the word passion. It's a commitment. You have a passion, you have a commitment, you have a culture, you have maybe two employees, 20 employees, they're brand ambassadors. You have to make sure you inspire them, you motivate them, you're all on the same team, you're rowing in the right direction, and you got to succeed. But surround yourself with good people. And like, you know, they're saying, if you go in the room, and you're the smartest person in the room, you're, you're in the wrong room. But really, take the ego away and, and, and invite people to be in your board of advisors or board of directors to add value to what you're doing and have a sounding board. That, to me, that to me is, is priceless. It really is. And many times, there are many people out there in the corporate world love to be on boards of smaller companies, nonprofits, and they don't care about if it's pro bono. All they want to do is help you make a difference. And so really, reach out to them and have a, have a board with diversity, perspectives. I'm not saying diversity of backgrounds. I'm saying diversity of business experiences, philanthropic experiences, human resource experience, whatever it might be. But, but have a board to, and have a great team. It's all, about, it's all about team building. It really is also. Scott, you got anything you want to add to that? No, I think, I think they've, good, they've done a good job. We can, we can move on to the next topic. Yeah, you have to well, go first but, next time, Scott, because Larry and yeah. I are characters. Yeah. Well, let's let's awesome. talk about. I'm I'm really interested, and I love what you do. And I don't get involved in naming products. I don't get involved in IP, trademark, whatever. Can you share with us what are some of the challenges? Are like you know I mentioned earlier about the landscape about building brands. What's the landscape about the IP process and 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 protecting what you own and so forth? And what 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 frustrates you or the clients that you work with? What keeps them up in the middle of the night thinking about their brand in terms of the things in your world? Because I'm not in your world. So I, yeah. I'm really fascinated to hear what are some of the roadblocks, challenges, you know, what, what are the things that they're, they're, they're not getting, you know? Yeah, no, uh, it's a good question, Larry. So I, I think the biggest issue that I see in working with nonprofits <laughs> is being able to communicate to potential major donors the benefits they're going to receive from being involved. Because Listen, there's no doubt that when large organizations or when athletes, um, other celebrities decide to put their name and their time into a nonprofit, um, usually to do good, there's obviously an altruistic element to that. There's no doubt. They just want to do right. But, right. but, uh, but behind the scenes, there is the requirement for most of these folks who have only limited amount of time resources to understand the benefit they're going to receive from being involved. So yes, they want to do good and they want to help, but they also want to be able to go back to their leadership of their company, or they want to know that they're spending their time wisely and they want to understand what that value is. And so we spend a lot of time 
helping nonprofits articulate to potential donors, you're, if you're going to give me X amount of dollars, you're going to spend X amount of time as a celebrity, as a, as a sporting, sporting celebrity, as an athlete, um, promoting my nonprofit, here's what I think that you're going to get in return for that. It's a really a way, not only to get them, you know, thinking, oh, I'm going to do good, but to, to really be committed to helping knowing they're going to benefit as well. So we spend a lot of time trying to think about, well, what are the economic benefits that donors and, um, and, and folks who are committing time, what do they get out of this? And, and so, you know, one of the first things when we start through this process is to just kind of identifying what are the benefits and then how do we measure those economic benefits? What kind of cost savings will you realize? Will you get a, you know, if, as, if you're promoting a brand as an athlete, will you open your, um, will you open, to get become open to new uh, potential uh, fans now, right? You, will you meet new people that you never met before? Will you go to a part of the population that you other you know, may not be interested in baseball or, or basketball, who might become a fan of yours and buy your and buy you know your branded products in the future? So, we're always trying to kind of link um, the the uh, the resources and the money being offered by the donors to what it is they're going to receive in return, so they can feel really good not only about doing good, but about also getting the same like the economic benefit that. It makes it a no-brainer to go ahead and, and to do that donation or to spend that time. Yeah, and also in nonprofits, I believe, and I know we talked about earlier, a lot of them are smaller. And then comes a concept called personal branding. You know, people are going to invest, are they going to sponsor, are they going to endow or support? They're really betting on the racehorse of that person, a few people. So you got to so you got to say as a, as a leader of a nonprofit, our own personal brands. You know, are we believable? Do they like us? Are we telling, are we authentic? Are we being honest? You know, because in a small organization, it's all, it, in, in general, it's always about people, but in a smaller one, they're placing their trust. They're, they're, they're entrusting you with, the, with their money because anybody who's going to support or endow an organization, they're getting hit every which way. So they, they have choices. So you got to say to yourself, easily as a CEO or founder or nonprofit ever, look at your personal brand because you're a product like anybody else. And like, you know, we're, we're all like, everybody here on the screen is like a cereal. We're, we're four people, but you know, people have choices, you know, and, and nobody, nobody, and really nobody needs any of us on the, on the screen. Nobody, nobody needs Michelle or Rafa and no, no one needs Scott, no one needs me. It's how do you create a want? How do you create a brand you personally, that people want to be with, they want to work with you. We want to write about you. We want to invest in you. How do we create so you're a want, not a need? And then when you want, you're aspirational. And then people say, hey, I want to be with that nonprofit. They're doing great stuff. They're really, they're, they're really moving and grooving like no one's doing it. So you have to, again, I mentioned, but you can't sit back. And, and you, you know, we use this term a lot, you're a game changer. But what are you really truly doing that's this game changing so people perceive again, there's nobody like your brand in the space that you live in? Well, I think, you know, I, it's interesting. I entered the nonprofit space in the major gifts area, actually. Um, and it kind of makes sense, even though you think, God, you need to have lots of nonprofit experience to do that. Well, I had a lot of marketing experience and I find it's easier to work with major donors than it is with small donors because major donors get it. They understand that when you enter into a conversation, there's going to be um, an expectation and an ask. And so it's, it is a little bit more of a business transaction. That said, the, the biggest thing and the biggest mistake that nonprofits make, but the most significant action that any nonprofit can do is to thank people. Um, and then the second most important thing to do, and I do it as part of your thinking, but is to constantly demonstrate the value of being a part of your organization's family. And so, um, you know, and I think, you know, that idea of what gets in the way of it is very often a very, and this is where the, I think where, where brands, you know, nonprofits and, you know, more traditional brands differ is that in the nonprofit space, it truly is not about me as an organization. It's about you as the person who supports the organization and the impact that you're having. And so, and you can't do that once. You do it when you, you know, you do a lot. That's where the storytelling comes in. You tell stories about the, the difference that's being made because of your support. And when you thank someone, you tie that thank you. If you're following up on a campaign, you tie it to the campaign. So, you know, if you're talking about X, program, then, you know, you thank the person for supporting X program. And because of your gift, 13 other children get to do Y or, 
I mean, it's threading that throughout. Um, it's also not asking all the time. I've always felt that if I'm doing a good job as a fundraiser, I shouldn't have to ask. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, someone says, how can I help? And that's the difference in, you know, kind of that traditional sales proposition and then a mom profit, you're pitching right in sales and, and in, in the nonprofit setting, you're creating, um, you're creating empathy, you're creating connection, you're giving people reasons to want to stay with you. And so it starts with telling the story of what you do. It's reminding people why it's important. It's showing the impact that they made and it's saying thank you. And it's, so it's not linear um, in the same way the sales transaction is, it's cyclical. You're constantly retelling those stories. You're constantly reminding people of the, how they've made a difference in the lives of the people that you serve. It is not about me as the organization. It's about the people that are supporting the organization and the impact they have on the constituency that I serve. Yeah, and what you're talking about, Michelle, is making the donor the hero of the story, right? And when you're talking about a, a nonprofit, yet yeah, the nonprofit is not, I hate to say it, but you're not the hero of the story. You're the guide. You're the Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're the Yoda. But right. the person donating the money is Luke Skywalker. And together, you guys are going to defeat Darth Vader. And so that, there's an art to that. Where's Princess Leia? <laughs> okay. Well, Princess Leia could be this, the, 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 you know, their brother and sister, uh, spoiler alert kids. But, um, but now, you know, you're talking about the art of storytelling and that was really, really, you know, insightful because a lot of nonprofits do want to make them the hero of the story. Look at how great we are. No, focus on the people and focus on the donors. Um, but in the end, you know, marketing is so important. So can you all, and, and I'll open up to any of you guys, you know, talk about the, the, how does a nonprofit market themselves? Is it the same as if, you know, be one of your companies, Larry, like McDonald's, or do they have to market? Is, is there a different uh, secret sauce for a nonprofit when it comes to marketing? Because a lot, first of all, we need to establish the fact that it is important for them to market their nonprofit. And if they don't understand that, they're already, I think, working with one hand behind, tied behind their back. Would you three agree with that? Yeah. So then the next step is how, how does one, you know, do that? How do they become one of the, one of the bigger players in the space? I, I feel that a lot of the um, strategies and ideas and initiatives that the big brands are doing, even for profit, they, they come right down to the look to the nonprofit. It, it's the same principle. It really is. You know, what's your brand voice? What's your focus? You know, I went, I went to a gala at the Boston Children's Hospital a year ago I, and this is exactly what, you just mentioned about, about the donor thing that Michelle Raffer mentioned and a gentleman and they, they told a story about what they want to do with a new breakthrough, or whatever. And one of the donors said, I'm going to, for $80,000, I'm going to put the Red Sox world series trophy at our table for the night. Now he, it wasn't, he spent $80,000 to the trophy at his table because he believed in what they were doing for the next two years to help, I mean, for, for example, in Children's Hospital in Boston, I don't mean to deviate this conversation, but I never knew that they had such mental health going on with children and they opened up an online program. And, you know, we always think of, you know, other, you know, challenges with children and, and diseases and so forth, but mental illness was key. And this was near and dear to this gentleman. And he spent $80,000 to have the Red Sox trophy in the table for three hours because it was important to him. So his story was relevant it really hit a nerve and he and he came to spend money that night but he picked and chose which lane or which um initiative was near dear to him to write a check right then there for eight thousand dollars so so i really believe that you know yes nonprofits. Uh, i mean they're all businesses too and same you know the same principles are the same strategy you have to mo motion connect like like michelle said what's your value proposition it doesn't matter to me whether you do a hundred million dollars or one million dollars you have to you have to you have to you have to break above the marketing noise you have to break above the marketing clutter and you got to be known for something otherwise you're a commodity you're in the me too business and you're not gonna you're not you're not gonna succeed because people are gonna put you into the you're gonna be stuck in the muck and you know and, and, and many organizations have three or four or five other organizations competing with them so what is it about your organization it stands out. And many people say, oh, gee, but we do what they do. No, but are they saying it? And they're not saying it like a rung on a ladder. You should put your, you should have that own that rung on the ladder. Because once you own the rung on the ladder, other competitors can say, we we do it. But once the first person to say it will win. You can't dislodge somebody. You know, once you own something, once you own that positioning or that mind share, even though your competitors are doing it, you're the first to market. You can't wait. You got to go with it. And I tell people, 
Always decisions are made on gut, gut instinct, experience, and research. You can't research for the next five years. You will never go to market with a new program, a new initiative, a new, a new sub brand. You'll never get there. You got to go with your gut and make it happen and, and, and just lead, be a leader, lead your team to success. Really motivate them, ignite them, spark them, and good things happen. I've seen it happen with, with a two person company and a 400 person company and 10,000 person company, but it's, it's the same dynamic that takes place because it, you're, 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 right, you're right, it's all marketing. It's marketing and brand building. It really is. That's what it's all about. You know? Yeah. You know, as it, Ray, for as it relates to marketing uh, the nonprofit and trying to kind of um, build that brand, I, I think one challenge, and, and this may be more geared towards larger nonprofits. I, I, I once worked for a, a really large nonprofit who was trying to figure out we have all these different constituents and they didn't know, you know, who to focus on or, or how much time and energy to focus on them, right? So you've got, individual donors, you have corporate sponsors, you have people who are volunteering their time, you have members, you have pro programs that people are interested in being involved in. And, you know, they didn't know, you know, how much time are we spending? How much, how much money are we spending on these different constituents? And how much bang for the buck are we getting at them? How much benefit are we see receiving for that investment of our limited time and resources? And kind of going through a process of analyzing, you know, what are my opportunities to reach the different constituents and how much time and energy and money and resources am I going to spend? And what am I getting back for that? I think that going through that process and thinking that through is often a huge eye opener for nonprofits to, to change, perhaps change the way they're going to market, how they market the company, how they build, the, excuse me, the organization, how they build the brand. Yeah, I, I would say that one of the priorities for me and, and you know, I've now worked in um, kind of in the senior development role for two different nonprofits as the first professional development professional. And my primary objective, you know, once you get to know who they are and what they do and who their donors are was to, in both cases was to diversify their streams of revenue. Um, because, you know, a lot of nonprofits, they've got like one guy who's paying um, half the bills or two thirds of the bills. And that's a huge risk. If he moves on to something else or she or that entity moves on to something else, the nonprofit's going to fold. And so diversifying streams of revenue is pretty critical. And as part of that, it's figuring out who the, what those streams of revenues are and how to talk to them. So, you know, donors want to see themselves in your organization. So as you mentioned, Scott, you've got kind of individual donors, but within individual donors, you've got transactional donors who are given, depending on the size of the organization, $100 or less or $1,000 or less. And then you've got kind of those mid-level donors. And then you've got your higher level donors. You need to be filling that pot continuously because you know at the low level, it's pretty transactional. Um, at the high level, if you can create that bond, um, you know, it could be a 18 to two, 24 month cycle to capture one of those people. But once you do, they tend to stay with you. And so, you know, that exercise, it is a very, it is a marketing matrix exercise. I mean, my, my matrix is huge. It's months across the top. It's, it's constituencies along the bottom. And then there's that core of, you know, branding, building my brand, generating awareness of what that organization does and how they do that. And so, that's things like your newsletter and, you know, there, there's ways to kind of continuously tell the story to everyone, but then, you know, on top of that, it's okay. How do I, how do I uh, talk to the guy who, you know, there's some people who give based on ego that that guy who gave $80,000 or whatever it was might not have given that money if he didn't have the opportunity to be present in front of a whole bunch of people who could see him make that donation. So, uh -huh. I, as a fundraiser need to, that's why, that's why events are great is because that's, those are the ego people. Those are the people that want other people to see them raise that panel for $50,000 or whatever it is. So you need to create a space for those people because they may not give somewhere else. And then you need to create a space for the people who like to get something in return, the shoppers, the people that do the auctions and the things. And, and then you need to create a space for people who, you know, one of the things that I've had a lot of success with most recently is, is building kind of recurring giving programs. And that's, you know, a $15 entry point. But um, this is interesting statistic in, in the fundraising space. Average retention of a donor is it's less than, it's like 50%. It's very low retention rates. Mm -hmm. But a recurring donor, if they've been with you for one year, you have an 80% retention rate. Uh -huh. 
Right. And if they've been with you for five years, you have a 95% retention rate. And the reason why they leave is because they die. And, um, <laughs> And so it's getting people. And so you need to invest in those $15 donors because each year you can bring them up and you can bring them up. And so someone who gives $10 a month is giving $120 a year versus the guy who gives $100 a year. Already you're making 20% more. And so, you know, thinking about those people. So it's really, it is truly a marketing problem or, you know, it's a marketing puzzle. Who am I talking to? What do they need to hear? What do they need to get back? So in some cases, it might be, you know, if I'm a corporate entity, what am I getting back as a corporate entity? As I, am I getting my brand in front of people? Am I fulfilling my CSR goals? I mean, there's multiple reasons why they're there versus the individual who, you know, wants lots of recognition and his name on your website versus the guy who in, in my last two organizations, in both organizations, the top donors were anonymous mm. because mm. it w truly wasn't about them. Right. And they were very, for the size of those organizations too, were the biggest philanthropic families in Chicago um, because it wasn't about them. They didn't want to see their name in lights. Right. You so, know, so they just believed in the mission of the organization. So I think it really is, it's, it's, it's very much the marketing, basic marketing principles, but it's the delivery of it in the storytelling and the impact, demonstrating impact that's different. Yeah, you know, Raphael, I just want to get in one point. I know we're, we're maybe with time, but the one thing I would tell every nonprofit, and a lot of them are small and the young are, they're very limited, the strap, right? There's a decision to be made. Are we going to grow our nonprofit organically? Are we going to identify other brands, our strategic partners that are going to help us with some muscle? Okay, so you say to yourself, if you can identify other organizations, other brands, that share the same culture, DNA, the same vibe, the same importance, th that can, I mean, and they have big muscle, maybe even bigger pockets, whatever, they can help that that small nonprofit grow and flourish. Mm -hmm. And I see more and more nonprofits really co-branding or creating strategic relationships with other brands instead of growing organically. And again, you know, the old saying, you know, by the brands you keep, if you can, if you can create partnerships with five or six other brands and, and multiply that, they're all brand ambassadors to your brand. Right. I mean, you know, the excess is really exponentially the kind of brand awareness and engagement you're going to get, not just engagement for new members and new customers, but, but more uh, people to, 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 to donate and so forth. So, so don't, don't feel like you have to do it by yourself and, you know, you want to be the Lone Ranger, you want to be the hero. There are many organizations out there that would love to create a relationship with young companies, young startups, young nonprofits, because they believe in them saying they want to they, they want to help you take you to the next level. And they have the muscle power and the people and resources to help merge together or align together. And therefore you look at them as a natural extension of your management team in some way, but they have to really align with your culture, your DNA, your vision, your mission, your purpose. That's key. But if you identify three or four of them, um, it's pretty exciting and you can have some rapid growth going on instead of like constantly, you know, pulling and tugging yourself, which is hard for any company size. It's hard doing it alone. It's really hard. And today's day and age, it's even harder. Well, and you know, companies who are going to want to make those be, be that partner, they will want something in return and that's okay. They're, they're, they're not giving away the money out of the kindness of their heart. It's because they want to associate with that brand because it's good for their brand. Um, exactly. go, going back to what you talked about, Michelle, you know, marketing 101 is knowing your target audience. So it sounds like that's a bigger challenge with nonprofits in your experience, because like you said, the top, you know, two donors were anonymous. So, so can you, can you guys speak to some of the challenges, the marketing challenges that might be unique to the nonprofit space? Mm, no, I it's a crappy back. question. All right, let's move on to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> I feel like I've spoken a lot. I mean, you know, I, I think the challenge is um, from a nonprofit standpoint. I mean, we've talked about kind of the principles of keeping it on track. I think the challenge that a lot of nonprofits face is, you know, you've heard the term founder syndrome, um, mission creep. I mean, all of those things kind of are the same idea, which is getting off target, right? It's that People, again, it comes from a deep passion of wanting to grow. Um, in some cases, organizations may have grown too fast or they're worried about the, their financial resources as, as many small organizations are. And so they start to drift into other spaces because they think, um, they think a donor might support it. So a donor says, hey, you know, I'll give you X dollars to do Y thing. If it's not in support of your mission, those dollars aren't actually helping you. They're moving you away from 
what you do. And, and so I think it's, you know, having that foundation, starting with that foundation of what is your core value proposition? What is your mission? And being able to constantly measure against that helps keep you on track. Um, but the thing I've seen most often is just that excitement of wanting to, um, wanting to grow, reach a certain number. And so pushing, um, you know, prioritizing growth over impact is probably one of the biggest factors. I don't know, Scott, you're kind of in that valuation space. I mean, I, you know, I see donors, they want an ROI, right? But the mm -hmm. ROI really isn't about how many people are served. You know, when you really drill into it, it's more about the quality of the service. Um, what are you seeing in that ROI? I mean, I know you're kind of in the number space, but are you seeing some of that less tangible ROI as well as part of what you're looking at? Yeah, well, there, there's always things that we identify as benefits that donors receive that we can't really quantify. I mean, listen, just being a part, being associated with a nonprofit provides like this halo effect, so to speak, um, that makes you look good. You know, not, the nonprofits are doing good things and being associated with them, you know, makes people think better of you. And then there's real things that you can actually like, um, you can actually quantify. So, I mean, we, we, did, a, we did an evaluation for um, a nonprofit who was trying to woo a donor. Remember the donors have, and this is a corporate donor, donors have options, right? There's lots of great nonprofits doing lots of great things in the community. They have options for where to go. So to get the most bang for the buck is definitely, I think something that a lot of corporate sponsors, for instance, are looking at. And like we looked at, you know, the size of the donor of the uh, of the donor base. How many people will you get access to? Will your brand as a corporate donor? How many people will you be in front of? And how can you otherwise? What would you pay to get that type of promotion of your own brand? Are those incremental consumers for you? People who wouldn't otherwise know you may not be your biggest fan. How do you how do you get them into your camp, so to speak? And so looking at things like how much it costs to, um, you know. To, to buy information about, um, about potential customers, because you may have access to email lists that you'll get from your nonprofit if, you know, if that's allowable under, under so the So what rules. puts that at risk? What's the, you know, we're talking about challenges. What, what's a risk for a nonprofit in this kind of space? Well, I guess the risk for the nonprofit is simply align yourself with the brands that are, are similar enough to you and kind of what they believe and what their brand promises, what, what they're offering to their consumers. You gotta be careful because we were doing a evaluation for a nonprofit. And they were thinking about getting involved in a deal with an automotive company and the automotive company in the, in the recent past had had a major recall issue, right? So, so there's like a negative safety, you know, concept around this company. And, and the question is, you know, they're willing to give us a lot of money do we want to be tainted perhaps by the fact that a lot of consumers are thinking negatively about that company right now? And does the money that we're getting offset, you know, that potential harm to our own brand of being associated with them? How, how would our donors think about that? So, you know, thinking through, you know, who are the, who are the donors? Do we want their money? Are they going to negatively affect our brand value the way people perceive us? And not only what has happened in the recent past, that recall has just occurred, but what could happen in the future, right? What are the, what's the downside? Obviously we can't predict what's gonna happen in the future, but certainly there are things that, um, there are certain businesses, certain industries where there's more risk for the brands in that industry that something negative could happen and the brand has some negative consequences associated. Yeah, I've, I've seen that a little bit, you know, thinking of negatives. I think another one of the challenges for nonprofits is they tend to build their boards based on people they know. Um, you know, they, it's, it's, I, I, I worked for nonprofits where, you know, five of the board members lived on the same cul-de-sac. And while that's great when you're starting, cause you want to invite your friends and being people, you know, that's a very limited sphere of influence. Building your board has a lot to do with, or, you know, if you're strategic about building your board, you want to expand your sphere of influence. So as Larry mentioned, you know, having HR people or, or having people that understand real estate and, you know, or if you if you own a building and you're providing services, there are people that understand the HR impact and the legal ramifications and things. But if if five of those people are all in the same industry or they're all living in the same neighborhood, you know, it's limiting your access to connections and networks, um, you know, and, and the greater pool of resources that that nonprofits need. So I do think that that's one of the things that young nonprofits tend to do. They build boards of people they know, as opposed to looking beyond that to seeing 
building boards that the organization needs. Well, I, we reached the end, but we did have oh, one question um, from somebody in the audience. So let's, let's get to it until they give us the hook. Uh, okay. It says, Michelle, do you believe there's a value in persuading major donors to not remain anonymous because their donation may encourage, inspire others to donate? Yes. <laughs> Short answer. Absolutely, 100%. They don't always do it. Um, and uh, yeah, But in fact, um, I worked with a, a major donor recently who gave the organization a million dollar organization give the organization three hundred thousand um, dollars it was anonymous and that was really really challenging because what we did and part of it is because i was looking you know again bringing marketing to the organization i wanted to have some data to present to them in terms of the value of doing that kind of work so i said you know 200 was it outright and the other hundred was conditional on some work that i needed to do and some reporting and and it was very much about driving major donor support and mm -hmm. it would have been lovely to be able to say you know right. rafer i'd like you to join in leadership with x family um and i wasn't given the permission to do that so they challenged me to build my major donor base but not be able to use their name right. in that process so yes absolutely having the name makes a big difference that said you can work around it you just you know you have to be thoughtful Ultimately, it is about the donor and what they want. So if they want to be anonymous, right. they got to be anonymous, you know? Well, thank you all. This has been a real stimulating conversation. Larry Gulko, go, pronounce your last name, Larry. Galco. Gulko. Just Gulko. call me. No, Larry Galco. <laughs> Larry Galco, Michelle Strauss, Scott Weingust. I'm Rafer Weigel. Thank you guys so much. This is uh, a really, really great conversation. We really appreciate it. So Taylor and Aaron, uh, I think you guys are up in terms of ending the feed. Thanks, Thanks. be well. Much have a great rest of your night.